Hi there, and welcome to another episode of the New Weight Paradigm with me, your host, Deanna Bedoya. And uh, it's been a minute since I've done one of these, because, uh, you know, <laughs> I also have like other things going on, as we all do. But I'm really excited to be back and um, sharing some things that can potentially help us perhaps reestablish a better relationship with ourselves, with our bodies, with our weight. I know a lot of us have <laughs> some deep conditioning around weight and our own bodies, and I'd love for us to kind of change how we how we interact with our bodies and how we live our lives by like, you know, being really okay with ourselves. That's what we're here to do is like do the most with the body we have and celebrate being ourselves and find our own unique ways of like enjoying the shit out of our lives. That's the goal. <laughs> so um, to remind you, my name is Deanna Bedoya. I'm a senior lecturer at Simon Fraser University in Canada. And, you know, I, I, I casually said the other day to my husband who was trying to tell me to go study something else. And I was like, listen, man, I have two passions, <laughs> weight and health promotion. And I didn't realize how true that was until I actually said that, that those are the things that like I care the most about and just like people living amazing lives. I care about that as well. So that's part of what I'm here to do. And if you like this content and you want me to make more of it, um, I love some external motivators uh, as well. So liking and commenting and sharing, it is appreciated. It means so much to me. Um, if anything really resonates, I'd love to hear about it. Um, I do see your comments, even though I don't always reply, but I do see them. Janet, I see you. Thanks for being here. Thanks for all the people that are watching or listening to these uh, podcasts. It means a ton. So um, let's get right down to it today. Uh, today, we are going to talk about what I like to call, or I have coined, <laughs> the appetite spectrum. And if it was up to me, we would be talking a lot more about appetite instead of just making ridiculous statements like people should just like, you know, telling people just eat less, right? All you got to do is eat less. Well, what we don't understand when we make some of those statements is that our drives to eat, our appetite, that's what appetite is, your drive to eat, our drives to eat are fundamentally different from each other. So yeah, for some people, it is as simple as like, just eat less when it comes to food, because that's all they have to say. They have to, it's like a very logical, <laughs> have a logical thought, like just eat less and then, okay, I'm going to eat less. And, you know, personally, I don't understand that because that has not been my experience. As much as I can tell myself and my thinking brain can say, Deanna, eat in, you know, eat less food or eat in a more moderate way. I can have that intention and I can want to do that. But what is harder, like we can see, hear our thoughts or like sense our thoughts, however we interpret our thoughts. I don't even know how I, I think my thoughts. I see my, I don't even know how, what my relationship is with my thoughts. That's for another, another topic. But, you know, I can have the thought of and notice that thought. That's a better word, notice. And I can notice that thought of like, okay, I want to eat less. And I can be grounded in that intention and it can be really aligned with my values, sure. But what's harder to explain and harder to pin down and represent is where this like feeling, this drive, this like, it feels like a force. It like moves me. Right. And, you know, part of that is related to dopamine, too. So there's like an action associated with it as well that can move me towards food, even when my brain's telling me, my thinking brain is telling me, like, you shouldn't eat so much. There's this drive. There's this powerful force within me. And I know it can be very strong for certain people that drives me to eat more than I know exists for other people. And I would argue myself, I'm not even at, let's say, the far end of what it's like to have a very overactive appetite. I'm, you know, closer to that than having no appetite. But, you know, I'm probably a little bit more in the middle or slightly like overactive appetite compared to other people. But there are some people where that drive to consume, it is overwhelming. 
it is overwhelming and it is hard to explain. <laughs> and sure, we can talk about brain regions uh, and their relationship with this drive to consume. So for instance, a place in, in something called our hypothalamus, specifically the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, which is our drive center in our brain. We know that some people, the sensing and like signaling that's happening in the hypothalamus, that is off. <laughs> that's very vague. <laughs> and it's very vague because it's also very complex as to why that might be off. And it can be off in a way that promotes some people to eat in an to a degree that, that they don't want to eat that much, right? Their thinking brain says like, don't eat that much, but this drive, this like overwhelming, like I keep calling it a force because that's what it feels like. A force like picks you up and moves you towards something. And it feels like it picks, for some people, that, for, that appetite drive feels like it picks them up and moves them toward food, even though their thinking brain might be even screaming at them, don't do this. So what the heck is that? And how are, why are there people on that end of the spectrum where that drive to consume is overwhelming? And there's also people that like have no appetite whatsoever. This is what I call the appetite spectrum. And as I go through this, um, this episode today, these episodes are all about you. They're not about me. They're about you. I'm going to use my stories to help you kind of see where you lie for yourself, but I'm only using my stories to like <laughs> show you how one, how it can, how these things can show up for one person, but you're going to have your own experiences with appetite. And I really recommend if like finding a healthy appetite and eating in a way that feels good for you, if that's one of your priorities, I think it's important to become familiar with like what your baseline is. Like if you were to say like the appetite spectrum between zero, no appetite and 10, like intense appetite, where do you think you lie on that spectrum? What number comes up to you, right? Are you right in the middle that your appetite seems kind of you know, not too much and not too little, like it's appropriate, let's say, for the level of energy you want to consume? Or are you like me? And I would actually say probably, I'm probably about a seven. <laughs> so I've been 7.5, eight, sometimes it feels like a 10, but it's probably not a true 10 compared to the individuals that have this overwhelming drive to consume. And we'll give you an example of how that can show up. So I want you to reflect on your own experience because again, this is all about you and figuring out where you lie. So then you can work with that. And then you maybe can be a little bit more compassionate with yourself about where you're starting from and not judge yourself so much because <laughs> then that can lead to emotional <laughs> issues sometimes. And emotional issues are one of the things that can drive our appetite too. So we don't want to do that. This is never about feeling bad about ourselves. It's about like awareness, understanding, and self-compassion. Okay, so that's what the appetite spectrum is. That's kind of an intro into that. But just again, to clarify, when I say appetite, I mean the drive to consume. So anything that makes you eat. And appetite is sometimes, but not always, promoted by hunger. So hunger and appetite are not the same thing. Appetite is an umbrella term. It's anything, basically. It's your drive to consume, but it can be caused by like any reason. So it can be caused by just like thinking of food or smelling food or seeing food or being bored or like, you know, it's a particular time of day and you think that you should eat at this particular time of day. But those can all exist also in the absence of hunger. Hunger is like, I need food. Is your body saying like, give me food. It's all about like nutrient and energy states. So like maybe you don't have enough um, energy yielding nutrients in your body or your body is craving something because it needs it maybe your blood sugar is low maybe you haven't eaten in a while you know energy is low all these things your body has sensors that detect that and send a message to your hypothalamus about that and that drive to consume is like more based on your body's internal states and your body's needs but like i said appetite can exist without hunger so even if your body doesn't need food, you might, what we call, want food. <laughs> you might want food for all sorts of reasons. So just wanted to clarify before between those two terms first. 
Okay. And if you're watching this video on YouTube, you will see what I consider to be a beautiful diagram, but I know when I show it to my, <laughs> my undergraduate students, they're like, oh my God, what the hell is that? It's this uh, conceptual map, and it's a map actually of what we call complexity, where there's, I don't know, 30 different variables, di very, uh, 30 different like brain regions or constructs on a particular, in a particular map with arrows going all over the place. And all these different like little boxes, they represent different things that can promote appetite in an individual. So these things include things like our habits, things like what we've learned in the past, things like our memory, things like our emotional states, things like our dopamine uh, system, things like our cannabinoid system, things like our thinking brain, things like our emotional brain, things like our environment. Like there's so many different things that can interact both internally and then our internal states you know, are sensing what's going on outside the body too, through our thinking brain and our perception. You know, we're taking in all these inputs and it's messing with what, <laughs> and it's interacting with like what's going on in our body and our brain. And our brain's ultimately just making a decision to eat or not eat. But my point is, is that I would not be a fan of like systems thinking <laughs> and complexity, complex systems thinking, if I didn't during a conversation about appetite say how freaking complex it is and you know we're just talking about complexity in my health promotion class this week and one of the main things that like differentiates things that are complex than just like complicated right is that complex things are fundamentally unknowable right or they lean to almost fundamentally unknowable like it's hard to really capture fully especially when we like start adding more and more people to the mix and so my point is although we're going to talk about appetite and we're talking about the appetite spectrum there's so much we don't know we're talking about the brain <laughs> if we're talking about the brain there's so many question marks even if we know what different brain regions do like how they actually interact in a complex human that's interacting with different environments that is <laughs> that is so hard to pin down right which is what makes it complex so that's why I keep getting back to like, what's your experience? Because at the end of the day, no one's going to really understand your appetite better than you can. So part of if you want to master your appetite and you want to feel more in control of the way you eat, part of that job falls on you. Actually, I would say most of that job falls on you without guilt, without judgment. But it falls on you to figure out what's going on. What are the cues that make you eat a lot? What are the times of day that make you eat a lot? What are your learned behaviors that make you eat a lot? What are your triggers that make you eat a lot? This is going to be very complex and highly individual. So I'll talk about appetite like in general, <laughs> but always keep in mind that it's highly complex. It changes over time. There's elements of randomness. There's all sorts of things going on that are hard to pin down. Okay, but the reason I wanted to do this particular talk today is that there is um, a saying that I hear a lot from people in smaller bodies, especially directed to individuals in larger bodies. And this saying is, I just don't understand, sorry, it's usually judgier. I just don't understand how people can eat so much. Just eat less. Like, I don't understand. Just just don't eat so much. And there's, <laughs> hopefully that came across judgy enough because that's how I usually filter that, right? It feels very judgy when I hear people say that. And it used to really like get my back up and I used to also feel very judged by that statement too. But I've had some clarity around this comment from people and the clarity comes in the fact that like when someone says I just don't understand how people can eat that much oh, the answer is yeah I, you're right <laughs> you don't understand if you don't understand how other people can eat so much that's because your body is different that's because your brain your complex brain and how it interacts with itself and maybe how it's like organized you know due to some genetic factors often right that is different for you it hasn't been your experience that you have this overwhelming drive to consume that some people have 
And someone in a larger body, they might in turn say like, I just don't understand why you don't want to eat everything in front of you. Like everything is like looks delicious and I want to eat everything. <laughs> and those signals that tell me to eat less, right? They're not here for me like they are for you. So, and I think there needs to be an element of understanding here and compassion here with ourselves and other people's experience, which we're not very good at doing <laughs> as humans. But we have to realize that the way we experience the world and the way that we interact with food is very different and individual. So if you don't understand how some people can eat so much, I agree with you. You don't understand, right? But that doesn't mean that we need to judge people that do have those higher drives to consume, right? And quite honestly, like this is this conversation is really timely because we're in the age of like weight loss medications, right? They've been around for a while. They've gone through several iterations, but a lot of the, you know, the popular weight loss medications right now, if we think at Ozempic and Wigovi and um, Loraglutide, Sixenda, they all work by decreasing appetite. And the reason they work for some individuals, and everybody's experience is going to be different, the reason they work for some individuals is those individuals are often those that have had a high appetite drive their whole life. And now that like eat more signal isn't pushing down as hard. It's not felt as strongly. And so their drive to eat goes down. And so, yeah, now it's simple to think just eat less. They can just eat less because that drive, that like force, that like, oh my God, I need to get it, that signal that feels so strong for some people, it's no longer there or it's there and it's a bit muted, especially with like these newer versions like Ozempic and Implogovi. But I have to say that everyone's experience is very different on those drugs and this isn't a, <laughs> this isn't telling, like I'm not a doctor, I'm not here to tell anyone what to do. I am not against these medications by any means, but I, I really do believe that you know, that is something that you need to discuss with your practitioner if that is the right thing for you. They do have side effects, but they are really bridging the gap in the gaps that exist in obesity treatment. So just a side note <laughs> about those. But the main point that I'm trying to make is that these drugs show us why some people are larger than others. Because as soon as these people with these often higher appetite drives go on these drugs, how do they work? Primarily, they work in more than one way, but primarily they work by lowering your appetite drive. So people eat less. And that's probably, and then, and then there's a conversation of like, well, are people cheating? Well, I would argue that it's kind of like a life cheat that you don't even realize you have to not have ever had that appetite to begin with. That's kind of cheating. <laughs> that might be genetically cheating, <laughs> you know, without actively trying that. But some people have that cheat code to begin with, right? All we're doing is giving people that have had the opposite of that, that higher desire to eat, something that helps them get back to that kind of baseline level. But anyways, I'm <laughs> I digress. <laughs> so I just don't understand how other people can eat so much. If that statement resonates that's okay. I understand that you might not understand that, but please understand that that is other people's experience and that doesn't make them bad people. <laughs> it's often not a conscious choice. Um, and if it was, that still doesn't make someone a bad person, but there are complex things going on below the surface that's driving the desire to consume. That is very hard for someone that doesn't have that same experience to understand. Okay. I need to move on. So, what I would like to argue in this um, talk today is that there is this spectrum of appetite experience. And like I said, if you want to go from zero to 10, zero would be someone with no appetite and some 10, 10 would be someone with what I would call an extreme appetite. Mm -hmm. And I don't love the word extreme here because I feel like it has a bit of judgy connotations, but it's the best word I could come up with, right? So some people have no appetite whatsoever and some people have an extreme appetite and there's all sorts of gradations in between. So the question is, where do you personally lie on that spectrum? If I can click through, we'll talk more about it. So 
as always, so let's talk first about people with no appetite or less appetite. It's, it's actually quite more rare that people have zero appetite whatsoever. It's usually because of something else, but it does exist that some people have to like <laughs> almost force themselves to eat. Um, I always remember I had a, like when I was, let's say 12 and I was in a much larger body than everyone around me and I was talking to my friend's mom who was always very lean and she said to me, I remember her saying to me like, Deanna, like I, I eat because I have to, like I have to force myself to eat because otherwise I wouldn't eat. Like I never think about it. I never want to eat. And I like, I just like, I really have to like plan to make myself eat. And I was like, well, I, I, I was like, my 12 year old brain like exploded. <laughs> I was like, I don't understand. <laughs> I don't understand at all what that experience is, but that experience exists for some people, right? Um, and, but like I said, it's complex, the reasons. I do need to say that, or just as a side note, I'm going to talk a little bit about eating disorders quickly. So if that's something that doesn't resonate or you don't want to hear about, like maybe just pause for the next little, let's say five, five minutes. But when I say someone has no appetite, in like the scientific literature, the term for no appetite is actually anorexia. Orexogenic, and that's O, orexogenic, makes you eat. And then in science, when we put an A or an AN in front of something, or in Latin, I guess, when we put an A in, or an AN in front of something, it means like less or none. So something that's orexogenic makes you want to eat. Something that's anorexogenic, it's like, doesn't want to you don't have an appetite okay so i know that the term anorexia is often used to describe individuals with the, what is considered an eating disorder um which is called anorexia nervosa however when i'm going to use the term anorexia i mean it more as a symptom of no appetite not as the eating disorder so just a little bit of clarification but that is that is the technical term for it okay what makes anorexia the symptom fundamentally different than anorexia nervosa, the, the eating disorder, it's classified as an eating disorder, is the fact that when it comes to anorexia, the symptom, there's no, there's nothing kind of going on as far as like preoccupations with the body or like a sense of control over the body or like, you know, it's less about like, there's, okay, I just, I'm so careful here because there's so many reasons anorexia can show up, but often what's kind of going on is there's something about how the person looks or um, trying to establish a sense of control or, you know, there's lots that can potentially be going on. But anorexia nervosa, that's considered an eating disorder, psychological in nature, primarily psychological in nature. Anorexia, the symptom, it doesn't have to be psychological in nature. Okay, I wanted to say that first. And like I said, anorexia, the symptom, can come up for all sorts of reasons. We do believe that there are genetic reasons, so changes in the human genome, then that can predispose to all sorts of differences in appetite. That is what the literature is, is, is showing. It's hard to like link it directly with the symptom of loss of appetite, but we do see it... Um, well, like for instance, with anorexia nervosa, the eating disorder, we do see a number of genetic changes that are going on in appetite-related genes, in and around appetite-related genes that can be disposed. But anyways, anorexia is usually, anorexia the symptom, <laughs> hopefully I'm not confusing us, is a symptom of something else. It can be due to like a psychological state, like depression and anxiety. It can be due to changes in circulating hormones as well and the perception of those. So like I said, there are so many potential reasons why somebody might not have an appetite. And just like a few of those, a loss of appetite can show up for like diseases like cancer right? Um, we also see it individuals that have HIV and AIDS. Sometimes a lack of appetite happens. That might be due to the drugs they're taking as well. Lack of appetite can be associated with the, the, yeah, the medications that someone's taking to treat another condition. Celiac disease, disease opio opioid use disorder. Sorry, I laughed because on my slide it said opioid us disorder. Opioid use disorder, which is not a laughing matter, uh, but this is someone that might have a um, uh, dependency on like uh, heroin or Oxycontin or um, 
or uh, morphine or any of those uh, opiates, um, which tends to numb your appetite, uh, which is why we also often see individuals that do have those um, use disorders are in very lean bodies. Um, alcoholism is something else that can promote a lack of appetite. Um, it can show up for reason. It, it is a symptom that we sometimes see with depression and anxiety, stress, tuberculosis, dementia, irritable bowel syndrome. There's lots of different reasons why someone might not have an appetite. Okay, and just one more example of this. Um, is found in the the new DSM, the last DSM, the Diagnostic, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, which is, um, but which is, sorry, <laughs> the condition that's found in that book that has to do with no appetite is something called avoidant or restrictive food intake disorder. So this is like a, a lack of appetite that's not anorexia. And it can be due to like, it can be due to like um, a previous negative experience with with eating or a certain type of food, where a person will avoid other foods or similar foods, I should say. Uh, this thing often actually shows up in kids, where like, like the kid doesn't want certain types of foods or just food at all, um, and that's. Yeah, is that really an eating disorder? That's an interesting one for me because maybe that child knows more than we know about what actually it needs versus what we think it needs. But that's another story. Um, and then there's some people that we would classify as having this avoidant and restrictive food intake disorder that just have no interest in food at all. And this again could be like my friend's mom that I told you about that just like ate because she had to. And so this is not about diagnosing anyone. This is not about like telling people what they have and what's wrong with them. Honestly, the reason I wanted to just kind of go over these quick examples is because it's important to realize that some people's experience with appetite is like, it's off. It's turned off. It's turned all the way off or very low. And there's all sorts of reasons why the appetite, your appetite drive can be turned all the way off or very low. And we see this in like my studies too. There's ways to, to well, there's ways to <laughs> play with some um, mice genetics, for instance, that can change the um, appetite drive of that of that mouse. So we do see these differences in appetites, not just in humans, but in other animals as well. And we have to understand that if that hasn't been our experience, if we're someone like me who has this higher drive to consume, we have to realize that other people, they are never going to understand our experience because they have a totally different experience for whatever reason that might be. They might be a two on the appetite spectrum, meaning they don't have the same drive to eat that we do. And they can just logically think, I'm going to eat, I'm not going to eat. And that's that's just a decision. It's a decision. It's fully decision making, right? Whereas individuals that we're going to get into that have these higher drives to consume, you know, a seven, eight, nine on the appetite spectrum, it's so hard to eat less for these individuals because that like appetite signal is turned all the way up, right? Or, or, or it's turned up higher meaning that that drive, that force, that like want to always eat always feels higher for them. And we have to understand that there's a spectrum of experience. And even if you don't understand someone else's experience in this, just be open to it being different than yours and ideally take the judgment out of it as well. Now, what about the other side of the appetite spectrum, the seven, eight, nines, and tens on that appetite spectrum? We have to remember, appetite is complex, we always have to say that, we're not planning, pinning it on one thing, we're just trying to understand that variable experiences exist. And again, because for, like a variety of experiences exist, there's many manifestations of this overactive which I'd say maybe a seven or eight on the appetite spectrum is to this like extreme appetite, which is like a 10 on the appetite spectrum. There's so many different reasons why these things can exist. Genetics plays a role. I'm going to get back to that in a second. So do changes in these circulating um, signaling molecules, like certain hormones, for instance, 
right? Changes in those circulating molecules that are supposed to like sense what's going on in the body. When that's kind of out of whack, the signals to our brain that tell us to eat, they can be really overactive. And to bring again back the, the conversation around Ozempic and Wagovi, what those weight loss medications do, Ozempic's really for diabetes, but it's also prescribed, let's be honest, for weight loss too. Um, what those medications do is they increase the signal of a, of a fullness they increase kind of the perception of fullness that some people experience because they increase something, the, the, the sensation of a hormone called GLP-1. And GLP-1 is a bit of a fullness signal, right? It's a signal that like lowers our drive to consume. It's a little oversimplistic to call it a fullness sim signal, but that's, that's what people feel. They don't want to eat as much. It's more like their appetite is decreased when they have this signal. Okay, so the reason that works is that for some people, the GLP-1 signaling is off, right? So again, that's another reason why some people might have a higher drive to consume. Psychology can promote a higher drive to consume food. So do learned behaviors, absolutely. If we've all, always done things a certain way, we've always eaten pizza at lunch and now it's lunchtime and now we want pizza and we've always eaten like five slices. We've learned that eating five slices of pizza is like a normal amount for us. It's a learned behavior, right? Those can be changed, but they are something that can influence our drive to consume. And other things that can influence our drive to consume are environmental cues as well. But usually when we are in like the extreme appetite land, like the, like the eight, nines and tens on the appetite spectrum, what is a belief about why people end up at that level, it usually has to do, or we believe it has to do with changes in the in the genetic makeup of that individual. And the genetic makeup of an individual can change the signaling to our appetite center, to the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus, which can have an effect that that like fullness signal isn't pushed down and the appetite signal is like <laughs> way turned up. Okay? So just to add some science to the mix as to like why we know that genetics plays a role in, in both obesity and overactive appetite. Um, a lot of the like really change in our perspective around this came through a type of study called a genome-wide association study, which I love talking about. And these are studies where like they've looked at the genetic makeup of individuals in particular, well, in this case, that have obesity. Right? So they're like, we have all this genome data, we have genome data of people with obesity, and we have genome data of people that don't have obesity. What's different about their genetics? And what they found is that there are more than about 100, depends what study you look at and how we define this, but at least 100 different areas in the human genome, right, in, in our DNA, these changes in our DNA at least about a hundred different sites in our G DNA, and I'm repeating myself, but it's hard to explain this stuff <laughs> simplistically. There's about a hundred different changes that are possible in our genetic makeup that can predispose to a person having obesity. And what was fundamental about this research that's appropriate for our, our purposes is that like everyone assumed that these genetic changes that are associated with obesity would be around like genes associated with like metabolism or like fat storage or like you know even our, our thinking brain and maybe like motivation and cognitive control and those kind of things but what they actually found is that the majority of the genetic changes that are more likely to occur in individuals with obesity those genetic changes occur in and around genes associated with appetite and you might, it might be hard, again, if you are in a smaller body, it might be hard to really understand what the genet, like the manifestation of those genetic changes could show up as. And so I have a video. I know this is a podcast too, but I'm also on YouTube. So you can go run and look at this at YouTube if you want to timestamp this. Um, but I will describe what's going on in this video because it's like one of my favorite videos to show in my class. Um, and the video that I'm going to show and, and talk through to explain how strong this appetite drive is when there are some changes in like signaling, 
there is what what's on my screen right now is there's like a mouse in a little uh, room. Okay, and I know we're not mice, but you know, <laughs> when it comes to like genetics of the brain, there are definitely similarities, and we can learn a lot about appetite by studying different models, including the mouse. Mice are often used with appetite studies. But what you need to know is that this mouse. It's a little weird, but he's got like a little hat on <laughs> and he's got a little hat on that sometimes shines this blue light. Okay, why is that important? What's happened is these mice have had this light, this light sensitive channel basically implanted right through the use of what's called a vector implanted in certain neural pathways that are associated with eating a lot. And in this case, it's the extended amygdala, which is an appetite associated region. It's not the only one, but it definitely has strong interactions with the hypothalamus. And we do see um, activation in the amygdala in kind of a lot of the overeating studies, studies that look at overeating. But anyways, okay, mouse, little hat on his head with um, a little light that sometimes shines and when this light shines the appetite associated neurons the appetite associated neural pathways are activated they like fire so I'm gonna describe what happens this mouse is in this room full of food He's got a bunch of cheese, <laughs> this like buffet of cheese. There's more cheese than like his own mouse size is what it looks like. But what you also need to know about this mouse, and there's a lot of descriptions going on, is that this mouse has been overfed. So their hunger is gone. We want to eliminate hunger and we really want to look at appetite. Okay, so this mouse, no hunger drive and no desire to eat unless the appetite associated neurons fire. When does that happen? When the blue light comes on. Okay, so I'm gonna describe the video and if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it go down, okay? So here we have this little mouse and he's in this cage. Blue light is on, eating, eating, eating. Appetite neurons firing, eating, eating, eating. Oh my gosh, give me more. He's like, he almost looks like he's shaking a bit as he's like taking this food. Eating, eating, appetite neurons firing, appetite neurons off, blue light off. The mouse smells the food, walks away from the food, no longer interested in the food, right? I'm full, I don't want that, I don't want that. It's still a stimuli, but oh, the light's back on. Appetite neurons are firing. He's back at the food, he's back eating it. He just took a massive chunk of food that's about half the size of his head, and he's eating on that because the blue light's firing, appetite neurons are firing, appetite neurons are firing. Oh my God, give me the food, give me the food, give me the food. I need it, I want it, give it to me. He's still eating, he's full, he's still eating, but those appetite neurons are firing, firing, firing. Lights off. Appetite neurons are no longer firing. He smells it, he looks around, and he moves away, okay? So I've shown this video in like talks I've given around appetite. Uh, especially to pop it, for populations that are like in larger bodies and I've had a lot of the people that are in larger bodies be like oh my god I'm the mouse <laughs> I'm the mouse I totally understand this of this like drive to eat even in the absence of hunger that feels like almost outside of yourself but it is overwhelming the effect of these appetite neurons right so if you don't have that sense of like wanting to eat all the time, that just might be your own experience. But for some people, it feels very intense. And what is a, you know, kind of 10 on the appetite spectrum example of this that has strong genetic foundations is something called bardet beetle syndrome, okay, or BBS as it's also known. There is a genetic associated this is a genetic associated syndrome that's associated with a number of factors like some people have extra digits on their hands and their feet, they have hormonal issues, they sometimes have visual impairments as well. But one of the big symptoms of this genetic disease syndrome is what we call extreme hyperphagia or hyperphagia, depending on how you say it. <laughs> and with these individuals, food is usually all they think about and it's the it's it's almost like below the thinking brain too there's this preoccupation with food 
all day long it's all about getting food that drive to consume it's that that like accelerator as i like to call it it's always pushed down right with bbs Bardet beetle syndrome there are a number of genes where that are associated with appetite especially something called the that are associated with something called the mc4r or the melanocortin 4 pathway that's part of the appetite signaling pathway in the hypothalamus that I've talked about. There are changes in and around that receptor, the genetics that lead to that receptor, that is believed to really compromise fullness signaling and really like accelerate the appetite drive. So in these individuals, they have an insatiable appetite. They often develop obesity at a really young age. And I heard this beautiful talk I, remember, I wish I remembered her name because I I tried to look it up and I couldn't find it but I listened to this beautiful talk by a mother um, whose child has BBS at um, at the obesity Canada summit um, this year and I've never actually seen a round of applause that emphatic at a conference before because this woman just like poured her heart out over what the experience was like having a child with bbs where the whole day and everything was structured around like how do we make sure this individual doesn't eat so much that it truly compromises them's health their health but this child doesn't really know what's going on and all they want to do is eat all day long and it's this overwhelming force that's almost outside of them that's driving um, that's driving this this feeling so there is a medication that can help to manage this uh, but this requires a diagnosis and this is extremely rare I should say that as well but what I'm trying to establish here is these like tail ends this 0 to 10 of the appetite spectrum where we have like individuals with no appetite whatsoever or very little drive to consume, like I eat because I have to, or I'm supposed to, but I really don't have any drive to. And then the individuals that are just like that drive to consume is so overwhelming that it's like it just takes over their entire life and they never feel full and they always want to eat. That's the other extreme of that. And then the question is, where do you lie within that spectrum? I probably put myself at a seven and that's why I'm such an advocate of appetite mastery, which I have a bunch of YouTube videos on if you want to look those up, because appetite mastery helps you like manage some of those signals because they can be there for so many different reasons. Okay, But understanding the appetite spectrum is also really important for just honestly having compassion with ourselves and, a, and an understanding of how much variety there is in our experiences with food and our experience of our drive to eat right so again when people say i just don't understand how people can eat so much the answer is you're right you don't understand and that's okay because you're set up differently your brain is working differently the signaling mo molecules in your body are working differently and it hasn't been your experience to have a high drive to consume like other people have but there are so many people in our population given how much <laughs> How much we see obesity rates continue to rise and we see higher and higher BMIs and I know I'm always worried when I ever bring up BMI because BMI is problematic don't get me wrong but the fact that we're there are there is such high obesity rates and like we're becoming larger as a species part of that tells us that some people have a higher diet to consume than others right and so and also our environment don't forget about our environment and what's changed in our culture as well that's all part of it too but you know there's some people that can exist in today's culture with food being shoved down their throat all the time and not have a drive to consume just fully be like i'm going to eat this i'm not going to eat this and that's it it's over and then there's other people that are put in the same environment the same culture I'm using the word culture vaguely because it'll really depend on where you are environment vaguely because it'll depend but there's also people that are in these like pushing food on you environments where their appetite drive is like yes 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 and it's very very hard for them to resist especially when like food marketers food manufacturers that it has been their goal for forever for us to eat a lot right that's like part of their business plan is for us to eat a lot 
right? And if we combine that with a higher drive to consume that some people have, I am not surprised that some people want to eat so much. Okay, but again, if that hasn't been your experience, we just want to be understanding that we're all in a different place. Okay, <laughs> and I know when I like first realized how much of an overactive appetite I have myself, you know, and when I realized that it's always going to be a bit more difficult for me to to keep a weight that I feel is healthy for myself, you know, I got a little pissed off. I was a little bit like frustrated and angry that like, why is my appetite a seven or an eight? Or for other people's, it's a two or a three and they, and some, and they think they're better than me. <laughs> maybe not, maybe that's just my own internalized weight bias, but you know, that's how it felt. Like these people that have a two or a three on the appetite spectrum, they think that like, I have no self-control. You know, when really I'm just trying my freaking hardest and it's just always going to be harder for me. So whenever I think about this, I think that, uh, I hate to say it, but it's just like the way it is. It's just the way it is that we're going to have different experience of appetite and we can manage our appetite, which is what appetite mastery is, which I'll get into in a bit. But also we just have to accept the things we can't change, right? I think of like the serenity prayer, right? Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. It's this way. All right, whatever. To courage to change the things I can. Because there are things we can do if we have an overactive appetite. Absolutely. And the wisdom to know the difference. So there are ways that you can manage your appetite if you are a 7, 8, 9, 10 on the appetite scale. But it might always be more difficult for you. But can you be compassionate to yourself about that? Right? Know what you can change, know what you can't, and work with your body. Because this isn't about us being against our body. It's about us working with our own physiology, our own anatomy, and trying to find the relationship that lets us live our best lives. Okay? So as far as working with your appetite, if you are a 7, 8, 9, or 10 on the appetite spectrum, step one is like, let's take the judgment out of it and sprinkle a lot of compassion all over it. Okay? We need to accept that our appetite might be higher than other people. We need to just allow it to send us signals because that's what our appetite system is doing. It's sending us signals, right, in response to a lot of different things in response to what's going on in other parts of the brain, what we're perceiving from our environment, sensing from our environment, what's going on in the rest of our body too. Our appetite center is just like, it's like a mini computer that's like making sense of all that and like telling us what to do because of it, okay? So we have to accept that it is it is doing its job. It just might, you know, have different, <laughs> have different sensors and different like, people working for it or systems working for it that look show up differently than for other people. One thing that you could also potentially do if you do have like a 7, 8, 9, or 10 on the appetite spectrum is instead of like getting mad at your appetite, which fair enough if you do, like I understand that, I get mad at my appetite too sometimes, instead of getting mad at your appetite or your body or your experience, why not think of your appetite as like not you, right? If you can observe your appetite, it's not you, right? There's a little bit of like acceptance and commitment therapy, a little bit of like <laughs> Buddhism in there as well. Like your appetite is not your experience of life. It doesn't dictate all of your experience of life. If you think of it as something outside of yourself and not like indicative of who you are as a person, because it's not, Right? If you think of it as something separate for yourself, then you can maybe look at it a bit more objectively and without the lens of like, there's something wrong with me, right? This is just part of your experience in your life, but it isn't fully your experience in life. It can't account for every experience in your life. And again, if we can observe something, it's not us. So like maybe give your appetite a name. What am I going to call my appetite? I actually don't have a name for my appetite. Ooh, I should think of a name for my appetite. Let's see. Okay, I don't want to push it, but I'm going to think about this. See, let's see if something comes up for me. <laughs> Your appetite does not define you is the main message there. And then another really important thing as far as working with your appetite is like to like do some investigation on it. And part of that is like allowing it to tell you things and then observing what it tells you. So when are there days when your appetite is low? 
or moments in the day when your appetite is low and when are there moments in the day when your appetite is higher and what's different about those moments right what's what have you eaten differently where what is different about your environment what's different about your thoughts what's different about your emotional states right what are the different things that affect your appetite and like how does it feel different so for me a good example here that i just still haven't learned from is that as a general rule i don't feel too hungry in the morning i usually eat a good breakfast it usually leaves me full till like lunch i eat my lunch and then usually around 2 or 3 p.m three yeah three three thirty four but somewhere between that area i have this like my second appetite my second lunch appetite that kicks in i've really talked about this it's good to reflect about this because this is true as i'm saying it i'm like this is true i have like my second my second lunch appetite that kicks in and what happens when i don't do something about it right like when i don't eat something like high in protein or like have like a a filling snack when I like deny that appetite my appetite signals go crazy after that and I end up eating a lot more at dinner and a lot more after dinner too so one of the things that I need to practice more of because now I understand that that's something that shows up for me is I have to practice more of really listening to that appetite signal around 3 to 4 p.m., right? And then making sure I have snacks on hand so I can help manage that. Ideally protein-rich, fiber-rich, maybe voluminous snacks on hand to help manage that. I've recently been making jerky in my uh, dehydrator uh, and I'm obsessed with it, but that's a really good high protein snack, salmon jerky. Oh my God, so good. And some beef jerky too. Um, But that's a really good high protein snack for me to keep on, on myself in response to my own experience with appetite. Okay. So that's just a story for you to then reflect on like what's happening with that feeling of appetite throughout the day and how does it change? Right. And so the next one I have on here, which really speaks to what I just said, is when our body is hungry and we don't eat. So when our body is sending us hunger signals, right, appetite signals, hunger is one of the signals that promotes appetite. When our body is hungry and it's sending us these appetite signals, when we don't respond to them, when we don't eat, right, those appetite signals those hunger signals can get stronger and stronger and harder to resist and so a good a good technique for not overeating as well is making sure you never get too hungry because i know for me again personally anecdotally by the time i'm so hungry i will eat (laughs) literally anything and everything you put in front of me So a really key part of my own appetite mastery is making sure I always have snacks on hand so those appetite signals don't get out of whack. Because when they're out of whack, then my thinking brain, it's got no chance. That willpower, that cognitive control, no chance. Because that drive to consume is like over-freaking-whelming. So what do you need to do to plan out to make sure you don't get too hungry? Okay? Something else, and I've kind of alluded to this as well, is we want to eat in a way that promotes fullness. So that means eating more whole foods, eating more protein-rich foods, eating more fiber-rich foods, maybe more voluminous foods. But this is really like figuring it out for yourself, what's going to work. But like protein is a big part of it. If there's like one food-related substance that really helps to promote um, more of a feeling of fullness, it's, it's protein. Okay. And then, you know, what are your triggers? This is again going to be a very personalized experience. What are the things that make you run for food? Are they emotional triggers? And do you need to remove yourself from the person maybe or the situation that's leading to those emotional triggers? Or do you need to work with a professional? Right? Someone experienced in those particular types of triggers, maybe due to past trauma or past experiences do you need to work with someone to address those triggers and how you respond to them right because those triggers are probably not just going to go away on their own and if we can't distance ourselves fully from them we have to learn how to respond differently to them and that is that again we're talking about psychology that's highly complex and it usually requires some sort of like you can do it on your own too but like probably be a lot damn quicker (laughs) 
if you worked with someone that's an expert in that, okay? And then another thing, and this comes out of like acceptance and commitment therapy and um, yeah, mainly acceptance and commitment therapy, but other behavior change models too, is like your appetite drive, if we accept that our appetite drive is always going to be higher than other people, if I accept that my appetite drive is always going to be like a seven, seven to eight, depending on the day, sometimes a six, but always more than five. <laughs> But I want to eat in a more moderate way because that's part of my goals. Well, those are in conflict with each other. So my goal is to eat less, but my appetite drive is saying eat more. So yes, part of the trick here is to manage that appetite drive. But another part of it is to like get really clear and grounded in your goals. And sometimes we just have to accept. Oh, it's so annoying. <sighs> Sometimes we have to accept that the signals that our brain is sending us, they're not true hunger. They are just like time of day hunger, or they are like situational hunger. Like for me, when I see other people eating, I want to eat even when I'm not actually physically hungry. This is actually not hunger, it's, it's appetite. But so I have to realize that, so I have to accept the fact that sometimes I'm going to have those signals even in the absence of hunger, even in the absence of true hunger right so acceptance of commitment therapy would be like why am i going to resist these signals well because my goal and my value system is for me to eat in a more moderate way because my body feels best when i do i i feel less full and less like uncomfortable because i'm not eating too much and if i give into this signal i know that i'm going to feel that way and that's not in line with my values and my maybe my identity and who i want to be as a person right so acceptance and commitment therapy is like you accept that it's challenging <laughs> but you move towards a, a a a desired outcome okay and then for some people the solution might lie in talking to uh, ideally an obesity informed and someone that's maybe done some obesity training, like the um, the obesity, uh, what's the ABOM exam? I think is one of the things that doctors can take uh, to become, you know, more versed in like weight bias <laughs> and weight management. There's more people getting um, getting certified in that area, so that's good to hear. But if you have a doctor that you feel comfortable with talking about this, because your appetite drive is too overwhelming and nothing I said is probably going to work, you know, maybe you talk to your doctor about um, medication options or surgery options, but that's not for me to, to prescribe to anyone. And I should say that even if you do go on weight loss medications, appetite regulating medications, I should say, or surgery, which also tends to affect appetite, even if you go on those things, you still have to change your behavior. So all these other things I talked about are still important. Okay, but as always, this is the new weight paradigm, and no matter where you're at with your on your appetite spectrum or on your weight related journey, we always want to remember that like we want to start from a place of fundamental self worth. Where whatever your appetite drive is, that doesn't define you as a human. That doesn't make you a bad person or a good person either. Right? It just it just is what it is. Right? So we want to start from a place and. <laughs> This takes work and takes reminder, and I struggle with this sometimes too, is that no matter what my weight is, no matter what your weight is, no matter what your appetite drive is, no matter what mine is, we are still worthy individuals, right? We are fundamental worthy as we're born fundamental worthy and we always kind of stay there. We just put layers and layers on top of that stuff <laughs> that gets in the way of, of maybe feeling that way. Okay. Also part of the new weight paradigm is finding the, the strategies that work for you to find the like body size that works best for you and not letting other people tell you what that is. Okay. And we want to work with our body as our ally in this, right? You know, you can think of your body separately than you. That's a technique too, but it's still, you're still in relationship with it. And you're in relationship with your body. You cannot detach. You cannot detach from that relationship. So if you're going to have a lifelong relationship with something, let's work on making that a friendly one. And part of that is just being nice to your body and caring for it and speaking nicely to it. And that takes a lot of work too, but we want to ideally get to that place, right? So that is... A little conversation about the appetite spectrum as always you deserve to feel great in your body and 
I hope some of these messages help you discover that there's nothing wrong with you, that you're not bad, you're not like unworthy or unlovable. I mean, you know, I'm just projecting my own shit out there, but you know, you're not any of those things because of your appetite drive or because of the way your body looks. Okay? You're awesome. And I don't care what anyone else has told you about or judged you about your body or your appetite. That's just like their opinion. And you can choose to listen to that or you can choose to live a life that's true to yourself and that's honest with yourself and that works with yourself and that ultimately ideally promotes joy in your life. So that is all I want to say about the appetite spectrum today. If you like this message, share it, like it. This, If you're listening on Spotify, give it a good review, give it five stars, subscribe. I don't know, all the things you need to do to help me uh, keep this moving forward. And you're awesome. And I think you, and I hope you have a fantastic day. See you next time. Deanna Vidalia. Bye-bye.